All right, welcome to the channel, everybody. Thanks for checking out the channel. This channel is called Ham Radio Dude, and I like shiny things. So I purchased the AY04. It's an Aliwins Yagi antenna for dual band operations, being in two meters and 70 centimeters. After two months of owning this, I think I'm ready to kind of give an overview about this and tell you one of the really interesting findings that I that I did discover with this antenna and even with that interesting finding, why I may not recommend it and why I may recommend it. Now, if you're not familiar with a Yaki, a Yaki antenna is a more directional antenna, meaning, you know, you point to the direction that you're looking to possibly make contact with and this will help you have a little more gain and maybe make that contact. So if you're going through something like woods this might help you actually kind of push that sign signal, <laughs> what push that signal through the woods. Uh, this also does have a lot of awesome characteristics for things like tropo season because when we're in tropo season, we really like to work horizontal and we like to see how far we could actually make that contact. So that's why I purchased this, and plus it was cheap, being seventy nine dollars for just uh, eight elements, three of them being VHF and the rest of them being UHF. But I ordered this antenna, the AY04, and uh, it comes disassembled. Now, actually, one of the nice things about it being disassembled is, I guess if you needed to go on an airplane, you might be able to disassemble this and kind of put it all together. Although I wouldn't say that this is a rapid disconnect antenna. Furthermore, this is advertised as an outdoors antenna for both vertical or horizontal, right? Because usually in horizontal positions is good for our things like longer distance two meter contacts and so forth. Except there is a problem here too. And let me see if I can't show you. Now, this is the vertical position. And as we could see here, these two screws were already, or these holes were already drilled out. This is for vertical configuration. You put a U-bolt in there, put it on a pole. You have yourself a vertical antenna, great. The problem was though, is even though they advertise it as horizontal, these two holes, I had to drill out myself. And unfortunately, I'm not the best driller in the world either. And what happened was, is as I drilled those holes, there's a little plastic piece that goes in there. And that plastic piece prevents water from going into the actual aluminum here. Well, when I drilled it, that plastic piece became compromised and if I were to use this outdoors, now water would go inside. An easy solution to that, uh, use like silicone if you want, or just build your own. If you want to build your own Yagi antenna, I'll leave some videos below to include one of mine where I made one out of a broomstick and uh, one of K6ARKs where he uses uh, antennas, or uh, excuse me, <laughs> the, he uses uh, arrows, uh, you know, arrows. I'm getting off a topic, let's get back on. And after I drilled them and I went to assemble this thing, uh, I did make a couple of more observations. My first observation was that the screws that go in between the elements, now there's two elements, right? On each of the elements is made up of two parts rather, okay? So you have this one, which is two parts. You have this one, which is two parts. So I guess each element is technically four parts, right? But what I will say is the way that they screw in just doesn't necessarily scream quality to me. And in fact, these seem very loose, if you could see that right here, hold on. That's as tight as it goes too, so. Correction, I was able to re-secure them. They did tighten down a little bit more, but there still is play in them. Uh, my assumption is, is that you're gonna have to check these frequently in order to make sure that they're not coming loose. You know, like I said, I could try to drill down more, but ultimately, this isn't the necessarily most secure thing in the world, which if it's gonna be outdoors and it's gonna be in wind, you know, I'm just not necessarily a fan of that. Again, uh, K6ARK made this arrow antenna and it seems, uh, it seems that his will be way more reliable and also unscrewed to fit in a backpack. But what I did do is after I got everything together and I did have all the parts, I think, let me just double check. No, I did not have all the parts. I was missing one cover. As you can see right here, this doesn't have a black cover like the rest of them do. And that's because it was missing. So once I finally got this assembled and the instructions were very small to read, but I mean, this was pretty simple to get together. There, 
in its defense, it's all labeled nicely. Like this is section one, and then these are labeled one. This is section two, and it's labeled two, three, and so forth. So you really can't mess that part up, provided you have all the actual hardware. And the hardware issue that I experienced, I think that other people have experienced it as well, because if you read the reviews, that's one of the main complaints is that the tolerances are off on the hardware <laughs> and uh, the hardware is missing. So it's gonna be a common issue if you purchase this cheapest antenna on Amazon. But what else could I tell you about this? Once I finally got this all set up and configured and put in the air, uh, it was nice to take a look at the standing wave ratio, and that's when things got pretty interesting. Now, one of the things that I want to mention about after getting it in the air is, you know, you check your standing wave ratio, you check your impedance values, and you could adjust them up and down right here and here. It uses a small Allen key in order to, or Allen wrench, in order to adjust it. You loosen this, you adjust it up or down, and you tighten it, and then you have a new standing wave ratio, and impedance value. And that's where things got really interesting because what I made the observation of is not only was I getting two meters, if I adjusted and tuned this, I could also get 1.25 meters. Of course, also I can get UHF band. And that's pretty wide band. So that was kind of an interesting thing and thought process. I didn't have time to test everything on 1.25 meters. And I would be curious to know in the comments below if you had this antenna, did you experience uh, like results? With that, I went ahead and that was all in the vertical position, but I'm gonna operate this thing horizontal. So I put this in the horizontal position and I ran some tests. Now, even though this is kind of a, a cheap product, again, and I also did drop it at one point, and let's see if we could see this here. As I dropped it, this whole thing bent down and in fact, this leg right here, or this element right here, this part of the element is uh, still kind of <laughs> a little wonky, but it only dropped from about three feet and it bend that easy. I don't see how this is gonna hold up in a windstorm, but all my operations at the moment are temporary setups and takedowns. So I didn't get to leave this up for three weeks or four weeks to, to see how well it held up. I don't think it would. And as I was setting everything up to, to use it horizontal during Tropo and a couple of contests, you know, I, I wanted to kind of point out that on the website, it's advertised that this is an SL16 connector, which is probably just another name for an SO239 connector, as that's what this is, or at least that's what I used and it worked. Now, when I set this all up on a 25 foot mast, I used my ICOM IC705 at only five watts of power at first, just to see how far I could be heard on the ground as well as in the air. And pretty much every time that I've attempted to contact N8YO, who lives in Michigan over, over the lake, somewhere around 110 plus miles, I've been able to contact him on digital modes like FT8. Actually, I ran my test at 10 watts with Mike using the 705 and external battery power. And at 10 watts at 12 feet off the ground, I was being heard at negative 17 to negative 20 on FT8. And then what happened is I went 25 feet off the ground. And although I thought I was slightly to his angle, but not fully directly at him, I was being heard at negative five to negative eight. And then when I directly pointed toward him or what I thought was toward him, my signal decreased to negative six to negative 11. But really with 10 watts, I made that contact to N8YO and, and that is quite a haul. Uh, like I said, I actually, let me give you an exact number of how far it was. Yeah, that was correct. According to freemaptools.com, 110 miles to Mike. So for 10 watts and you know, 25 feet, even 12 feet, I'm, I'm contacting Michigan. And I think that's great. I should also mention that during those days, or at least at that time, I don't recall there being tropo conditions. There may have been though. And I say there may have been because we've contacted each other multiple times, some days with conditions and some days without. But I was really happy with those results to be heard in Michigan, 110 miles away with 10 watts of power on my ICOM IC705. There is the potential that I may have been heard and may have heard Mike better with a better cable. I was using RG8X and I had 
50 feet of it. <laughs> So if you know anything about losses, RG8X is a lossy cable on VHF. Probably more so lossy on UHF, but I still was able to make a contact, which I think is probably better than <laughs> if I didn't have anything at all. My receive experience on the vertical was that I was receiving stations further away than I was with a standard rubber duck antenna, which I, I would say was to be expected. But I wanted to point out what type of cabling I was using to just again, point out that I did have a compromise and everything you do in radio is going to be some sort of compromise. You know, sometimes we compromise our cable and we lose a little bit of our gain or uh, we have a little bit of loss rather uh, in order to make things kind of work out. And that was the case here. And so the next point about, uh, about cable I wanted to make is even though I used an SO239 to SO239, you could easily get yourself an adapter uh, to convert it to something like a BNC, that wouldn't be the right one. But the point is, is SO239 to BNC or SO239 to SMA. So, you know, this becomes kind of universal in that standpoint. Finally, I decided one morning to wake up, put this thing up at 25 feet and try to work the VHF contest that was occurring in July. Uh, I'm going to see if I can't find the results. But unfortunately, that tablet has crashed because of a Windows update. To give a better idea how I had that Yagi set up during the contest, it was horizontal and off the back of my truck, as you can see here. I would then just rotate the mast in order to determine where I wanted to try to contact. And these are some of the stations that had heard me. I made about 10 contacts in total during the three hours I did the VHF contest, and they were all in FT8. So I've been using this for a couple of months now, and yeah, I kind of mentioned the quality issue here. These bend fairly easy, you know, and there's just a lot to be desired in the quality assurance of this product to include missing parts. Um, one other thing I will mention is this match system is okay, but it uses two nuts in order to loosen and then adjust and then tighten so that the match system stays in place. And the problem with that is, is there's such small nuts whatever you're going to say is say it now uh, that uh, when they fall into the grass, as you're setting this up, you'll, you're never going to find them. So what I would recommend then is to go to Ace Hardware, pick up uh, some extra nuts and just carry them along with you because eventually they're going to fall out of place and you're going to lose them. What I would probably recommend the most though, since I was really disappointed that it wasn't drilled for horizontal though advertised as it, I would probably recommend that, you know, maybe you save up an extra, well, if you want a Aero single band VHF antenna, you're looking at $83, so not too much more. It's a three element and it should work just fine if you're not gonna do UHF anyway. But if you're looking for like a dual band UHF antenna, it looks like, and I haven't used this one, it looks like Moonracker over at DX Engineering is $115. So yes, you're paying, let's just say nearly double, but I'm sure you're gonna get the quality there and DX Engineering is gonna support you. This thing is just an Amazon special. <laughs> I don't know what else to say except uh, it works. I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm not saying don't buy this, but I'm also saying like it's really shoddy quality. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope it helped you make a decision on whether or not you wanna purchase this. And I, yeah, I hope you learned something. If you did learn something, would you let me know in the comments below? Uh, and I hope you have a good one. Until next time, this channel's Ham Radio Dude. Ham Radio Dog's back there. You know the story. Likes, get him cookies. 73.